Special guests on our broadcast today, joining me from his home in a place where the weather is much better than here, uh, out in San Diego. Let's bring into the broadcast Randy Carlisle. And Randy, thanks for uh, joining me here today. Of course, uh, Pittsburgh sports fans recognize the name. Uh, Randy played in over a thousand games in the NHL, several years here in Pittsburgh with the Penguins, and then went on to coach roughly a thousand games in the NHL, including a Stanley Cup uh, champion year uh, with the Anaheim Ducks, and of course remains the only Norris Trophy winner in Penn's history. Randy Carlisle, welcome to the show today. Uh, thank you, uh, Jeff. It's uh... A little warmer here, you know, I'm sitting out beside the pool, just overlooking the pool here in the backyard. It's going to hit about 75 today and sunny, so yeah. I feel for you guys with the ice storm that's uh, entering into your area. Yeah, you've got it a little better out there. Uh, first off, let's talk the your, your Penguins days. Everybody in the Pittsburgh area still recognizes the name. I, I think you were the last pen to go without a helmet is one of your claims to fame, but of course the Norris Trophy. Uh, do you still have some pretty fond memories of your years here? Oh, yeah. You know, I, I got traded to Pittsburgh in, in 78, 1978. That's just going to show you how old I am. Uh, and uh, it was really the break of my, my career. I, I was, you know, playing behind uh, Gloria Salming and Ian Turnbull, two standout defensemen in Toronto at that time. And then when I went to Pittsburgh, I got an opportunity to play. And, I got big time minutes, and that's all you can really ask of a, anytime you make a change. And trades do happen in the sports world, but you like the opportunity to prove yourself. And Pittsburgh gave me that opportunity. And you know, we had some success early in the career, but later in the, in that 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 was pre Mario Lemieux, and uh, there was lots of transition taking place in, in uh, our hockey club. But it was a, an enjoyable time, and uh, some of the best friends in my life, and you know that. The one person that I went back to after all that time was Randy Bendis, and as far as the harness racing industry is concerned, and we get hooked back up after 25 years. Yeah, and that's uh, people are wondering why am I sitting here on a harness racing show talking to a, a, a hockey guy? Well, you were a racing guy uh, all along. Uh, in fact, just found out recently that uh, your history with racing didn't just start with your time in Pittsburgh. So, uh, how did you get involved? Well, I played junior hockey in Sudbury, and after I finished my uh, grade 12 in high school, I was still eligible, uh, you know, to play junior hockey. So, what I did is, is I, I got a, a job, a part-time job. The racetrack in Sudbury uh, was about two and a half miles, three miles from my home, and I had some friends there that were working in the horse industry. So, I started uh, with a basically a part-time job in the mornings. I my time time was seven in the morning till noon. And then once I was done, I'd go home, shower, and then we practiced in the afternoon in Sudbury, which was about, oh, about 10 miles away. So basically what I had was I had a part-time job in the mornings and then some race nights when we didn't play. And uh, I was able to eke out a, another $75 a week. It doesn't sound like much, but when you're making $60 a week playing hockey and another 75 with a part-time job, and doing something that you really enjoyed and, and got hooked on, it, it wasn't really a job. And, I moved on in the, in the harness industry into an ownership position after I, I was drafted by the Leafs and at one point uh, I'd say we, we owned quite a few horses but they weren't to the caliber of horses that, that are out there today. We were basically buying claimers and involved in the claiming business and uh, uh, they were $2,000, $3,000 claimers. I think the, the most I ever paid for a claiming horse was $6,800 and uh, we claimed a few and had some fun with it. And, and even in, in uh, the summer months, one of the summers, I was the paddock judge. So I worked on both sides of it as far as the racing industry, but the ownership part was, uh, has been something I've, uh, I've stayed close to uh, for a number of years and I've really enjoyed the, the, the business. I enjoy the, being around the animal and the people that are involved with it. And some of the people that uh, people might be f familiar with in, in Pittsburgh would have been Bill Fay. He was a, a, a driver that was at top of the game and then I claimed the horse with Randy Bendis, and we claimed the horse by the, by the name of Flying Abbey. I think still to this day that that was the fastest horse that Randy had ever sat behind, and he was driver trainer at that time. And I know he that's been a while. Yeah. Well, well, that's probably 25, 30 years ago that 
he was uh, the driver at that time and, and that gave him his fastest drive of his lifetime in 59 and 2 i think when we broke our lifetime marks we had lots of uh, lots of fun in the race business and i enjoy the sport and uh, i've been around it and i've made some great friendships over the years well you had horses here as you said back during your stint with the penguins but i guess was it the uh shut down from COVID in Canada a couple of years ago that kind of sent you back to this area and to the Randy Bendis barn. Yeah, we, what happened was in, in Mohawk uh, up in Canada, this big track there, and we had a, a mare that we purchased as a three-year-old uh, turned four, and we had some, some issues with her, and then COVID hit, and we finally got her right, got her back racing, and then they shut down the, the racing industry in Ontario. So. What we did is we made the phone call and we shipped her to Randy and the horse's name was Royal Esteem. She turned out to be a decent mare. She she came into the meadows and she could took actually took a new leg time mark there with uh, Randy Bennis, her trainer, and I think Dave Pallone drove over over that night. But she was a nice mare. She was uh, a, she had lots of speed, got good gait speed. Uh, she just wasn't really what the, the type of trotter that I was looking for. And, and my idea of a, a trotter or any racehorse is quality, not quantity. And my belief is, is that you try to find a horse that can race in the top 30% of your purse structure at, at the track. And, he, and it's hard to find those horses because everybody's looking for the same thing. And right. yeah. uh, what I tried to do is try to stay with the quality versus quantity. Well, and you have a recent addition to your barn. I know you said you recently sold one, but uh, you raced a horse here yesterday that uh, has done very well since coming to the Meadows, and that's a horse named Jewel of Magician. Uh, how did you pick that one up? Well, I, I've been actually I found that horse up on Gate. Uh, that's an on-site uh, website that you can find. Uh, people put horses up for sale, and it's an online auction, basically. And, and the horse didn't sell, so the, the tra trainer at that time... Uh, he pulled the horse back and then he raced the horse and the horse was in the pop-up series at the Meadowlands. So I watched the horse a couple of times. I made some contact and we finally were able to work out a price that I thought was appropriate for the horse. And my, my motivation was to find a horse that I, I could depend on and, and maybe develop into a, a stronger racehorse. And so we bought a three-year-old Gadabra, the jewel magician. He, he had actually raced in Ontario over the summer months in a what they call a grassroots series and he didn't do extremely well but he was a young horse big strong horse and he and he had good gait speed and he was a, the type of horse that we believed or i believe that can develop into a, a higher class resource and hopefully that he can continue to grow and my belief is as i stated is is I'm, I'm looking at a horse that possibly can race 30 to 40 times a year give them a little break but uh, I, I always like to see them pull on the left line every once in a while versus always on the right line to make sure that you have something in left at the end of the mile that's part of the owner in you and that's also part of the coach in you too i think where, where you're uh, looking at that situation uh randy it's you know we see pro athletes from time to time get involved in the sport of racing as an owner looking for a hobby but for you uh the story is very different you know you were you've been involved with this from the start so I, it seems like you've really got uh, a lot more knowledge of of this sport than most people would realize because you've lived it as you said uh all sides of the job uh, starting down starting way back at sudbury down so uh uh, I'm sure it's it's been you know a, a side venture for you, but now uh, is this something are you looking to perhaps add to the stable and continue to grow? Well, we're always looking, you know, we're always in, in, in on the hunt for a good one, and you know, I've I've found that I've owned over 20 horses or 20 racehorses over my career, and I've found that uh, that it's hard because everybody's looking for the same thing, but there's nothing like the enjoyment of of your horse going out on the track and, and coming down the home stretch with that win. My heart still thumps with it. I get the excitement out of it. My wife doesn't understand that. <laughs> she doesn't see that. But I, I really have the passion for it. I've been involved with it for a long time. I've worked as a groom. I've worked as, as, a, as a, an individual that, that fed the horses and, and worked with the horses, jogged the horses, trained the horses, uh, babied the horses, did everything that we possibly could. To make sure that these animals that are cared after and, and looked after properly i have a daughter that uh, was in the jumping side of it uh, but the ribbons didn't pay many bills is what uh, <laughs> that would be the one thing that i could say about the racing industry over the jumping industry 
that uh, the, the ribbons don't pay too many bills, but I, I enjoy the race business. Uh, some of the best friends I have in my life, I talked to him this morning, actually, Mike Noble. He's a guy that I started with uh, as a 20 year old. So again, that those those routes fly uh, along and I enjoy my, my time around the track and being and talking with race racetrack people and, and the people in the backstretch. Well, Randy Carlisle, thank you for joining me uh, a lot earlier in the morning out there than it is here out in California. Uh, open invitation. We'd love to have you come back to the Meadows, enjoy some of our races here in person. Uh, but you can wait till it gets a little warmer. Well, I, I, my plan was just a few times was to, to make sure I make the track well. I actually spent six months down here in, in San Diego. I have I had a home here since 2013, and I have a summer cottage up on, in Ontario on Manitoulin Island, and it's only about a 10-hour drive to Pittsburgh, and I've made that drive many a time, and hopefully I can get out there this summer and catch the, the races live and, and uh, have a little bit of fun with the boys in the backstretch. All right, Randy Carlisle, best of luck with Jewel and Magician. Thanks for taking the time to uh, join me on the broadcast today. You're welcome anytime, Jeff. All right, Randy Carlisle, former Penguin, former Anaheim Ducks, Stanley Cup winning coach and one of our horse owners here at the Meadows. Post time for our first race of the day is coming up right around 1247. Let's get you.